That's not a keyboard. This is a keyboard. OK, let's rewind just a bit back to, well, 1981. In the early 80s, home computers became very popular in the UK. In school playgrounds, kids used to argue about whether the Sinclair ZX Spectrum or the Commodore 64 were the best computers. And there are an awful lot of videos on YouTube extolling the virtues of both those machines and many others besides. But if you had sensible parents, or you had surprisingly deep pockets for a child, then you could own a BBC Micro. The BBC, yes, that BBC, decided they were going to make a series of educational programmes about home computers, and they were looking for a machine to feature in the programme. They found that none of the existing computers really passed muster, so they cast around asking various computer companies if they could come up with something, and Acorn came up with the BBC. Compared to most other home computers at the time, it was quite a revelation. It had a very solid, decent, mechanical keyboard. Now, a couple of other computers did as well, but the BBC was kind of in a class of its own. Inside the keyboard, there could be a variety of switches. It depended on exactly which model of the BBC you had, and when you got it. These appear to be Futaba key switches on mine, but there were a variety of other switches used, including on, I think the BBC Master used the Cherry MY switches. Yes, there are Cherry switches other than MX. Now, if you have a look at the tops of these, you'll see a very familiar cross pattern. Surely they're not MX compatible, are they? Yes and no. The cross on top of these switches is actually bigger than the Cherry MX one. And as a result, you can't fit normal MX keycaps onto these switches. But you probably wouldn't want to because they're not the greatest switches in the world. So can you take the caps from these and fit them on Cherry switches? Yes. Yes, you can. They're a bit loose. But it does work. And with perhaps some shims or something to fill the gap a little bit, they could actually be just fine. The keycaps themselves appear to be made of double-shot ABS plastic, and they were made by a company that at the time was called CompTech. These days, they're called Signature Plastics, and they're still around. In fact, as somebody pointed out when I showed them a picture of this before, the legend on the keycaps is still in use today. I wanted to make my old BBC keyboard into a USB keyboard, something that I could plug into a PC today and still use. Now, there's a few problems with this. One, it doesn't have all the keys that a PC does. I perhaps should have started with the BBC Master because it has a numeric keypad, at least. But there's all kinds of oddities with this keyboard, with the extra keys like break, and the fact that function keys run from F0, and there aren't enough of them. And some of the keys are in somewhat strange positions, or at least according to the legends. Hmm... Plus, the case that a BBC Micro comes in is really rather large because it contains the entire computer as well as the keyboard. Now, there is a partial solution for this because back in the day, there were some third-party cases made where you could separate the keyboard from the system unit and have them connected by a wire. Trouble is, these cases are quite rare, they're quite expensive, and they hardly ever come up for sale. After searching on eBay for many years, eventually one came up. But this one wasn't a plastic case like the others, it was a metal one, and not aluminium. Steel. Yeah, steel. Now there's not very much to it inside. There's a slot at the back for passing the keyboard cable through. There are some little metal supports with rubber tops on them to rest the keyboard on, and there's a couple of bolt holes at either side, which is what screwed the keyboard into the original BBC Micro. Right, so having got the keyboard mounted in the case, there's just one more problem to solve. How on earth does the signal from the keyboard turn into something USB? Well, I didn't have to solve this problem myself. I actually sat down and started trying to work out the keyboard matrix and exactly how the voltages worked. And then I discovered that the wonderful folks at Tynemouth Software had already solved the problem for me in a much neater and tidier little package than I could ever hope to imagine. Now, one of the most disappointing aspects of this was I couldn't quite fit the tiny circuit board underneath the keyboard. It needs a bit of clearance because it's a steel conducting case underneath it. So it needs to be on standoffs to keep it away or perhaps some kind of insulator. So I couldn't quite get it to fit in. I would also have to cut through sheet steel in order to fit a USB socket. So in the meantime, I've used a standard electronics box just to mount the little board and to deal with the wires. Far from ideal, 
but it will do until I come up with something better. Now the sharp-eyed among you may have spotted a little piezo speaker there mounted on the board, and it makes a noise, because when you switch on a BBC Micro, it actually makes this beep-beep noise. The keyboard does it as well. Not nearly as well, sadly. It's a bit weedy. Uh, Here's what the keyboard does. So yeah, if I was going to improve something, that would be something I would look to change. So in terms of things to improve, I would like to integrate the circuit into the keyboard housing, uh, cut a slot for my USB socket, and perhaps improve the quality of that sound coming out of it. But it only happens when you connect it up. Now you might be wondering what it sounds like to type on this. I do remind you that this is a steel case and it's largely empty and very resonant. There are no doubt any number of things I could do to mitigate the sound of this. Anyway, here we go. Here's a typing test. And here's my normal keyboard in the same position with the microphone at the same distance, just so that you've got some kind of comparison. Yes, indeed, this keyboard is loud. Now, what's it like to type on? Uh, well, another thing that I've got slightly wrong is the angle on it. Despite having the keyboard set on feet that are actually correct, they're actually original BBC Micro feet, it sits at an angle that doesn't feel right when you're typing. And these switches, you really need to be pressing down practically vertically on them to get the best feel from them. Um, also, I really need to open them all up and lubricate them in order to have them functioning properly. So there we go. That's a look at the noisiest mechanical keyboard I own, uh, certainly the most impractical. It's the BBC Micro turned into a USB mechanical keyboard. And if you're interested in doing this kind of thing yourself, well, you will have a heck of a job finding a case. I can't help you. It took me years to find one. And if you want a metal one like this, it's the only one I've ever seen. I wasn't even familiar with them back at the time. I knew there were plastic ones back in the day, but metal ones, no, I never saw one. So you're on your own there. But if you look in the description below, there are links to Tynemouth software and their USB circuitry. They have them for a wide variety of 1980s home computers. So there we go. A quick look at a rather strange mechanical keyboard. So until next time, ta-ra.